Nick Kane, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Rob, thanks for having me, mate. It's uh, fantastic to join the juggernaut of the Pacey Performance Podcast. Mate, I get nervous. I get nervous when there's someone on the other side who's just as, even not more experienced at doing this stuff as I am. So uh, thank you for coming on and thank you for thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure. Would you mind just giving us a bit of a background on you, Nick? How you've come to yeah, do what sure. you do from a business perspective, the sports map stuff, and obviously your, your role at Essendon. Yeah, spot on. So, uh, yeah, as I said, pleasure to be here. Uh, currently head physio at Essendon Footy Club, which is in the AFL down in Melbourne. Uh, I've been here for nine years at the club and head physio for the last three. Uh, so loving that side of work. Uh, I started up a, a sports education company around sports physio and, and rehab about eight or nine years ago called the Sports Map Network. Uh, we've got a fantastic team there. Uh, working to, to, to deliver what we think is world-class content um, for sports physios um, through our masterclass platform. So uh, really targeted, I guess, from what I see in um, either the physios I've worked with or my experiences over time and to fill those gaps in. Uh, some of those learnings for those people that are really keen to either work with athletes, work in sport, or just simply uh, get better at what they do so they're at the top of their game. So uh, it's been a pleasure working in that space with some uh, unreal uh, presenters and, and clinicians in there taking part in that education so uh, that's been a huge learning experience for me and, and love doing that uh, and then aside from that have a, a couple of clinics in Melbourne uh, which also have an awesome team of physios working there and, and podiatry and and myo uh, so that's growing and uh, I still enjoy doing a little bit of clinical work and working with those guys that's called complete balance physio and um, yeah aside from that just uh, Happily, happily married to my wife Jess, and I've got a uh, almost one-year-old daughter. So, the last year has been uh, unreal. So, nice change up from, I guess, a, a work-orientated sort of life to just, um, yeah, loving the family life, mate. So you've got Sports Map, you've got the clinic, you've got Essendon, and you've got a one-year-old. Spot on. Yes, no, so relatively full I books at times. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was a busy man, but fair play, juggling all that. Good work. Yeah. No, Good I, work. Uh, thanks. People often say how I do it, and my answer would be I have an awesome wife in Jess, and I think uh, also have an awesome team at, at both of those businesses, and it wouldn't be able to do it without them with the, the physios we have at, um, you know, at, at Complete Balance and the rest of the team at Sportsmap. So very grateful for all those people to help out. One thing that comes to mind straight away and i don't know if it's just a uk thing but i know people do get and whether it's just a perception or whether it's actually reality that clubs here may get a little bit nervous if a member of staff has a like a uh, a visible side business or a clinic or some consultancy outside of their role how does that work with essendon and your multiple things going on <laughs> yeah well thankfully um that's not the case otherwise i've been a bit of a bit of trouble, but it sort of has entwined nicely. And it's probably not something that I had designed by that nature, but uh, Essendon's really supportive. And I think it's because um, the business has the ability to bring awesome clinicians to us, like Edna King, for instance, Jordan Menaguchi, Craig Purdom and the like are running our courses. And a lot of the time we run those courses at the Essendon Football Club, which has a great conference facility. Um, and our staff get access to that, the Essendon staff get access to that as part of the, the perks i guess so our staff are learning and developing off, off some of the best and i guess it also helped me become a better physio which then in turn helps the players at the club so i think that side generally has always worked well and um and look from the clinic side of thing it, it started uh when i was first started essendon and i probably needed the extra income really uh at that point in time and it's just sort of grown from there and, and now one of the clinics is actually at the football club so that's in the new section of the footy club so that again uh, links up quite well uh, so, uh, yeah, they've, they've somehow just orchestrated to, to blend into each other and, and assist with both ends. So, yeah, that's probably a, a real blessing. Love it. I'm very envious of the the growth of all the different streams. It's, uh, yeah, sounds good. So the, the, the kind of crux of the conversation, especially in the first half, is going to be something that will, I'm guessing, will resonate with a lot of practitioners here in the UK, well, wherever you are in the world, and pretty much whatever running sport that you're involved in that's groin injuries and groin return to play as a global thought process when it comes to returning an athlete who's suffered persistent groin injuries rather than kind of the 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 one-off 
um, when they come to see you. But what's your what's your kind of general approach when it comes to groin injuries? Yeah, well, it's a, a well-rounded question, and I think you sort of alluded there that the context is probably being those ones that we see that might come in after a few months uh, of groin pain rather than uh, my adductors just a little bit sore because I'm uh, out of the game on the weekend. So if we think around that sort of athlete or person that we see, I guess first and foremost is sort of nailing down a diagnosis and um, I think our clinicians to have good skills in that and I know uh, there's plenty of research out there to more talk around movement and, and things around groin, which is super imperative and certainly still apply that into our rehab. But at least knowing what you're dealing with and knowing what stage of the pathology you're with and, and, and letting that sort of guide, I guess, where to start your initial um, initial starting point. And I think, you know, one thing uh, we'll talk about Edna King a little bit later and, and, some, and some bits we've sort of pulled away from his courses, but one thing he would often say is it's either for rehab or, or it's not. And I think if it's not for rehab, then obviously you've got a pathway you need to work through. But if it's for rehab, it's just like, bang, okay, this is us, this is what we're about. And and then we just need to start our process. So I guess for for me and where I start with that groin process is uh, trying to look at the athlete as a whole and, and nailing down what I think is really contributing to that uh, pathology. So that starts with a, a thorough assessment. So certainly looking through some functional stuff from our single leg squat, overhead squat, hopping, um, end of calf, end of end range calf raise ability to, to hold that position. Uh, certainly taking us through our general range of motion assessments and trying to pick out any imbalances or changes there and tying that in with some of our strength work. So always want to make sure we're looking through hip abduction, hip extension strength, hip flexion, uh, abdominal sort of loading tasks, and sort of getting a picture on what you think of your big rocks is where I'll probably go to. What are my biggest rocks that I'm going to attack first and foremost? So I think with groins, you can pick everything and go at everything. But for mine, it's like, what are the big big three that we're going to go after? And I think if you're seeing some, some changes around, you know, if it's a hip extension and hip abduction on the right side and there's a clear imbalance there or what have you, then that's going to be pretty, probably pretty high. And you generally find, you know, the hip strength is often right up there in your, in your big rocks. Um, and then working our way through, I guess, to find that out. Uh, in our assessment, if I'm thinking sort of physio table stuff, we might be... Uh, looking to see what I guess can change your pain to guide where you're at. So simple things like what actually improves your squeeze power. Uh, might go and, and, and really go hard at some hip and glute exercise and does that improve their squeeze power? Um, tying in, you know, some lumbar pelvic positional um, changes and does that influence our, our, our clinical tests? So uh, a bit of posterior tilt or embracing sort of some abdominal work, does that improve? Where you're at to guide further suggesting that hey maybe this lumbar pelvic stuff is guiding some of our pathology here or driving some of our symptoms uh so then and, and then hitting starting at a, at a point where uh you know finding your way in on that essentially nice mate i've just got the, the first there's a little bit of a delay so bear with me um when you mentioned about ender and the for rehab and the not for rehab can you just guide us what would what would put one athlete in one box and what would put one athlete in the other box yeah i mean certainly taking in the level of pathology and and some imaging so i guess for mine if you're most thinking anything around the groin theoretically you'd like to think that is for rehab essentially and if you are taking things further and you know, we know we need to rule out the hip and if there's clear pathology within the hip, a significant label tear that's really influencing what we're looking at, that may be something we need to go down a certain path. Um, they're the sort of things that stand out for me. Clearly, um, surgical options for around pubic pain, groin pain, uh, adductor related stuff is maybe like something you'd look at at the very, very end stage, but clearly not something we jump to early. So I, I think for the most part, people i'd see that surgery consideration wouldn't come uh too 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 much in the short term for us um unless there's like a clear medical thing uh, a hernia for instance or something like that that really needs to be repaired would be something that would go down that path so out, out of the avenues or the the certain exercise that you would look at to see what presents pain in this in this particular uh group of athletes what kind of objective data are you, are you getting off any of those 
So I know you mentioned the single leg squat, the overhead squat, and a few other things. Where are you collecting your objective data from in those? in that long list that you mentioned? Yeah, so uh, obviously a reasonably extensive list. And I guess to sort of step through, initially it's probably just having a look at those aspects as a, as, a, as a visual representation of where they're at and picking out what you're seeing. So before I move on to some really true objective testing and benchmarking, which I think we'll, we'll move through and chat about in a second, I guess it's more about looking at, okay, their single leg squat doesn't look too good on the right side. Uh, and then I go and test their hip abduction strength and that's clearly showing a deficit. And then their, their hip extension might also show a bit of a deficit or some hip rotation. That's clearly probably bringing that level of importance up higher for me. So it's more about stepping from there away and then probably working our way through some of our key objective testing to really see if that marries up. So objective testing for where we start to get true numbers. All right, so certainly an isometric hip abduction test uh, where we'd like to see them anywhere from 2 to 2.5 times their body weight. Um, a hip extension, so which would test in a, in a 45 degree position off the, end of a, uh, off the end of a plinth with a force transducer, and we're looking at something closer to 10 times, 9 to 10 times body weight for that hip extension. Uh, our hip abduction is clearly a really important thing and often look anywhere from close to 1, one to 1 ratio for our add to abductor ratio. So we'll do that in an isometric fashion as well as part of our initial benchmark. Uh, certainly when we're chatting to around our groin aspects, I'll be certainly looking at some objective numbers uh, around hip flexion and doing this in a sort of 90 degree position and zero degrees uh, and tying that in where that sort of fits. So again, uh, if we're seeing a deficit at zero degrees, that would probably drive where we're going to um, coordinate some of our hip flexion exercises to get that adaptation versus if we're feeling it more at sort of 90 degrees or in a range, we'd probably address that more within our rehab so I guess the first part in that exhaustive list is what I went through without trying to go into too much detail and it was more about just probably some physio 101 bits around tying in what you're seeing. The hip range is down a little bit on one side to hip IR but their hip abduction is also down. So am I going to go and chase just trying to improve their hip IR with treatment and different things or am I actually thinking well what's driving the loss of hip IR if I think that's an important component to my groin rehab and that may be you know hitting up through their glute med or glute max or, or some hip rotators. Um, so taking that on to the further line around some of our uh, objective testing, we certainly do. I think some of the lumbar pelvic stuff is really important and it is a little bit hard to quantify in a sort of one-off testing. So, uh, you know, a double leg lower test, so two legs up in the air and lowering down and seeing if they can control that without really falling into some anterior tilties like one easy on the table test that would certainly look at. I'd like them to be able to lower their legs all the way to the floor without uh, losing their lumbar pelvic control. Uh, initially, I wouldn't look to like some capacity measures of uh, side plank and, and plank testing things for that, but just to get a bit of an idea on, you know, how they're moving and, and what level they're at to guide, I guess, uh, you know, to see where probably some of their deficiencies lie and where would I start in my exercise prescription and entry point to start to try and address that. I probably should have asked this at the start, Nick, but what burden do groin injuries, hip and groin injuries, but let's bunch them all together. What burden does that have on you as a as a football club, as a AFL club? Yeah, look, it's you don't see too many games missed with groin injuries, um, unless you really lose one. And uh, probably three or four years ago, we had a, a couple of really well documented groin injuries that missed a substantial amount of time. Uh, and, and it has since been a really huge focus of us and our club to sort of bring that down in a big way. Uh, so in sense of games miss and burden, it's not super significant. However, it's, it is common practice to see these groins that do affect players throughout the season. They often ability to play with their, their groins. However, clearly their performance uh, is often hampered and their ability to train session in, session out at intensity is really hampered as well. So... Uh, I think around uh, nailing these very early or, or picking these things up early in a club setting, so this is back to, I guess, uh, fitting with our prevention chat uh, later on, it's super important to sort of be on top of it from the get-go and have your management to address that, like really aggressive to, to address what you think is driving it and get on top of it as, as quickly as you can so it doesn't lag on. So from some of the assessments that you do, Nick, um, have you got any benchmarks that you've built up over the years so you, it can guide you to a 
to a point that you're happy with and, and you can kind of progress from there? Yeah, certainly. And I think it's a balance between both our clinical benchmark testing and also what we can sort of produce in the gym and get a, a bit more of a level of capacity and, and function in our benchmarking. So we sort of, I guess, for the physios there to really make sure we're looking at or we're extending ourselves more from the physio room and into the gym to be able to look at some uh, and tease out some of these capacity and, and strength markers. And I guess if, if we're a physio and that's not our skill set uh, within the gym, then it's certainly about working with someone who who, we, who that is. And obviously many of your listeners are, you know, within the S&C realm and, and experts in that space. So I encourage the physios to really link up and, and get an athlete in there and work through what they're seeing and work through what you're seeing to tease that out. I guess from my approach, uh, as I said, I think some of those benchmark testing around ab, ad, adduction and hip flexion for the groin stuff is really important and some of our lumbar pelvic tests uh, but then first of all you know we'd go into the gym and let's say we're at a level where our pain's settling down and uh, you know we really want to have them at the level where they're the highest level of capacity and tolerance to then be on the field and not break down again so we're sort of building confidence within the athlete and also in our confidence that we know the athlete is at a good level so I guess I'm looking at where do I want that athlete at that point uh, where is he now and then how do we get there so starting with the end in mind a few of those things um, you know we know that the loads and the forces and the preventative effect of, a, of the long leave and Copenhagen test is really is really important so getting him to that level is is part of what we'll do and it's probably not a starting point many who have just coming out of some pain and function won't be able to do that but getting him to do that and you know for me that looks like at least a sort of 30 second hold if it was a long lever isometric or at least sort of two sets of 10 doing some eccentric concentric work um you know some basic uh, as i touched on before lumbar pelvic sort of capacity measure tests you know a side plank 90 seconds front plank two minutes in, in good control and, and good positions um you know really clean single leg squat so i know you asked around the objective measure of that i mean it is a subjective and, and a visual component but being able to do you know 10 really good uh, pistol squats down to nine degrees freestanding you know in, in good form and fashion would would be a sufficient sort of marker for me to, to get that to in that middle term stages um, certainly their ability to do a split squat that is pain free and under some under some decent loads to to feel like they're um, you know in that position and feel comfortable with that so something that we sort of worked off before is at least 30 kilos in a split squat uh, and, and really biasing that rear leg position for some really nice uh, rec fam load. Uh, and then just, you know, a really good abdominal higher end function. So we've talked through some some side plank and, and front plank, but either some uh, really clean reverse ab curls or some hanging leg raises, just some higher level lumbar pelvic exercises to, to get them to. So for me, it's sometimes stepping into the gym, looking at some of these or modifications of these and getting an idea on where they're at and then from there, we need to pull some of our objective data. Okay, so a hip abduction is down and hip strength. So we may really isolate those within some exercises as well as then tie those same um, focus points for us into some more heavy loaded gym-based work that we think is still really addressing those deficiencies. Um, that's probably where we'd go to if I was really focusing on the groin stuff and that's not forgetting about just your general strength through that I think a lot of the time. Some of the guys who have had groins for a period of time is generally deconditioned. So not forgetting just some general benchmark stuff that you know you guys would have in there, predominantly some leg press targets, uh, squat targets, deadlifts, hinge targets, and things like that, at least to so body weight to know that they're at least lifting some decent weights in, in positions that are gonna sort of improve their general capacity and function and movement. I'm gonna take another detail on it because things could come into my mind. I'm excited to ask you about this kind of thing. So I don't think there's probably anyone or many people out there who could answer this better than you, so no pressure. But you mentioned the kind of the S and C physio and you mentioned that if if as you, if you're a physio and this kind of thing it isn't your thing, look to work with an S and C. What is the state of physio of education for physios to be able to become competent on this side of the kind of spectrum? And not have to rely on a, an S and C and be and be competent in that area. What what's that education look like currently? Obviously, you're plugging a, a gap for a reason because there is one. But from your perspective, what is the what is the gap? Is it a huge gap? Yeah, and and this wasn't a planned plug from you to sort of for us to drop in any any sports map information. But no, 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 absolutely not. <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's part of like what 
uh, probably we do see is that part of our offering there to sort of in ensure that physios are scaling up on past that at really cute level stage and actually being able to then develop further through that middle and later stages. And, and I think, though, to answer your question, it's it's one around really knowing limitations and knowing where you're at and knowing, you know, where you're at as, as if it is as a physio and when those gaps sort of do lie for you. So not trying to take on things that you've just seen on social media and integrating it. But I think first and foremost, there isn't huge amount of great education for physios to that later stage. And we're talking here, you know, true S&C components. And I guess the way I probably do uh, rehab or the way I do my rehab, so to speak, and I'm lucky in working in a club with great S&C staff and, and rehab staff like uh, Alex Cajun and, and Connor Daly and Sean Murphy. But I think... I see the physio's role within a sporting context just to really clean up, so to speak, the injury. So clean up the pain, clean up the dysfunction, clean up those real imbalances and clean up those real clear deficiencies in some of those things I've spoken about there and getting them almost to the level where like, hey, this guy is now good in a way. He's He no longer has groin pain. He's addressed those things I'm thinking contributing to that. And now, you know, from a point of view about training, speed, power, and really driving all those things in performance, I'm like, like here you go, like go, go for it because he's clean. And I think where it can be difficult is um, he's still got some pain and he's not quite there yet, but we're trying to add in, oh, he's got to do some speed power work, so let's put some speed power work in here. Or he's got to do some jumping, so we add that in here. And in the end, it's just boiling over and it's just, in the end, we haven't fully addressed the actual pain and dysfunction and we're trying to follow this model of rehab and it's sort of like, so that's personally probably where I see. And I, um, but further to that answer your question, there isn't much in the sense of um, uh, education that's formal out there. And I think clearly I'm really lucky in the sense having worked in an environment where you basically learn off some of the best uh, going around in that space. And I think that's probably the best way to do it as a physio to surround yourself with people who are really good and just um, feed off them, be a sponge, ask questions, watch what they do, think about how they're doing it and how you might apply your bits into it um, as a physio sort of minded speak and uh, and then try to upskill from there. Because I think it certainly rounds out your ability to follow through the rehab if you can um, move through those phases more efficiently. I find this area super, super interesting. Yeah, no, it does. I, I, I think this area is super, super interesting from a, a business perspective, but an education perspective, because I think there's a lot of, and you'll know, a lot of SNCs who will be tasked with late stage rehab, and they've never done any late stage rehab, and it just becomes part of a role, it, there's no formal education, and they're probably looking to the physios and the more experienced SNCs to learn, where the physios are doing the same thing, looking to the SNCs, and more experienced physios and this like gap in between where it's it's all probably like experiential learning there's no formal um education that's pretty where people like you are doing so well because there's there is that gap that each profession is looking kind of the way and there's this merger in the middle would you agree yeah well definitely um, i mean you know the, what you what you the stuff you guys are doing is like that top end sort of work which that blends in to the uh, late stage rehab and what we're doing is probably bringing it up to the level which blurs into that late stage rehab without the end so there's definitely the crossover and it is um it's a it's a really it's a it's a really interesting area it's a great area to work in and i think for the people that do it really well really excel in it um and I, but i think it, it, it's not really ever just one person's role and i think the way it works really well is if you have a really good physio who can work all the way up to that level and and, and to an extent say okay you're better at this than me let's you know, how are you training their uh, run mechanics? How are you training their acceleration mechanics? How are you going to integrate this uh, training volume and loads and um, getting to sort of top speeds, match demands? How are we getting that information together and that data? How are you now lifting with really good uh, strength technique and strength output? Uh, how are you eliciting good power, speed, power, and performance? Like, that's all really part of a, a comprehensive rehab, and it has to be. Um, but I think, as I said, I think where it gets difficult and where you can break down sometimes, and I think even one of the questions was said uh, at one point we're going to touch on is some of those um, error points, so to speak. I think it's one of those where trying to do those things with even this athlete we're talking about here, the groin person, if he's still some anterior groin pain and he's struggling with something, but we're trying to 
pull out that little bit more of speed and power, you can just come unstuck and then you're wondering, why is he getting sore? Why is this happening? It's just because he hasn't like got to the level yet, essentially. So you need to either address why that's happening more efficiently or you might need more time to get him there so he can then just get on with it and not have pain afterwards or pain during it and, and, and you should be away. We'll come on to that in a, in a, in a, uh, a minute. But I was speaking to Jonas Dodu recently. He spoke at the Sportsmith Speed Conference. And I would have presumed that his services are required or um, called on the most by S&C coaches look, you know, looking to push that higher end. But it's actually the physios and the therapists who are tapping into it from a rehab perspective. And I think a huge percentage of his consultancy and his work comes down that end versus the S&C end. Um, which I think is really interesting and really encouraging that they're looking to the performance side to kind of upskill and make that blurry bit in the middle, um, I suppose, as tight as possible. Yeah, no, and, and Jonas is, um, I think, finding part of that middle 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 point. So clearly there's uh, some uh, great research or, or more research coming around around the importance of, you know, the neuromuscular or, or the running mechanics aspect to hamstrings and either hamstring injury prevention or uh, and performance and reducing the risk. So, you know, with his level of coaching and, and things there, clearly physios want to tap into that and clearly that's an important part. Um, I think as long as the physios have done, done the work early around, you know, um, you know, getting the athlete in the structurally to, to be able to perform that and that's actually there's a Jordan Meneguchi one for you so they need to be able to have the structures they can, and, and hardware so they can then perform that exercise so you try to throw someone out there with you know poor lumbar pelvic control weak hamstring poor hip extension strength or whatever it is even with great running technique maybe they we're not we're not probably not covering all our bases there so if we can continue to sort of clean that up and then tie some of you know Jodas's I think certainly some of the, the drilling stuff um, can be done a whole lot better around and that early early running and, and tying that in with your, your rehab as you know Jonas would do and then bring that together if you've got some of his skills around some of that speed stuff well you, you're definitely away and uh, if we can if we can all pull pull some of that off, um, guys like that then we'll all be certainly better for it and you sent me up a minute ago with the question but I think it's a nice one to kind of maybe sum up on this uh, on this topic of groin injuries common mistakes when implementing the system into team sports and dealing with this issue so yeah okay so i guess groin uh it's probably not uh underloading essentially is probably where i'm, I'm going with that yeah. and and to find those deficiencies and, and tease out those things i think we're pretty good at that generally it's sort of like well clearly his his strength is down there or there's an there's a range of motion deficit there or his function there is not good enough but and then if they still have some pain how are we addressing that in why that pain is there are we still sitting back and saying oh you got some pain let's rest or just do a couple of little band exercises and um and hope it goes away and takes many flames and that's still there weeks later i think we can really get in early and, and get really good load in to address what we want to do with that's some um, with weights and obviously you know there's different exercises that we we utilize to do that uh, but going hard at it and going hard at it early, obviously there's some things where you'll need to you know, tease away from and, and what have you and respect the injury itself. But uh, I think underloading in that early phase and, and middle phase is certainly something that just will drag the groin issues along because we're not addressing what's driving it. Uh, and then probably just the other one is, and it probably ties into what we're talking about a bit there, was often a groin will fail you if it's a more of a chronic groin and we're dealing with these more complex groins around the, the anterior pubic region they often won't fail early they'll fail late and you'll put all this work in for five and six months or whatever it is and you'll get them there and their their strength and capacity level and everything's probably at sort of let's say you get them to 90 percent and then they go and you know perform games uh, repeatedly or high level trainings and they break down and essentially probably just not taking whether it's that extra bit of time or really nailing like having really clear benchmarks in your mind and not accepting anything less than that and saying we have to be here and then going so essentially trying not to get that final tip off where you know i hear it's probably the, the common uh, one that i speak to physios about they sort of do a great job right to the end and then they get sore after four or five months and then you know they're struggling again so it's probably those two things that are, are probably the main part and, and i guess um 
I didn't touch on it too much, but we often, and I talk to hip, hip strength and things like that, but maybe not addressing the anterior chain enough uh, within our rehab. So I, I talked a little bit around the hip flexion strength and you know abdominal strength or whether that's yeah, yeah, oblique work or even some rec fem um, loading. Uh, I think if we just only hit the uh, hip strength and things like that, we may be missing out on some of the key things. One thing on the benchmarks and not compromising, and it's that, and it's it's got to hit that before we progress on to this, or we let them back into training, or we let them um, play competitive games or whatever it is. How hard is that for you when you're getting pressure put on you from those that have the power? Um, yeah, it's, probably not, it's not too hard, I, I don't think. Like, I, I think... Clearly, you can get yourself into a bit of a hole if you're saying something like, oh, he's going to play in four weeks' time, and then you're like, oh, no. Like, It's probably about buying your time and setting the expectations a little bit longer and, and really rather than trying to set a date in mind, it's working forward, but working aggressively forward to, to make that change and um, you know, really put on the athlete early and saying, hey, this is where you're at. This is where I want you. Let's get there uh, and making sure you're getting some routine testing. Um you know, we always have a conversation around return to play and people would say, oh, well, he's at 92% and you want him at 95 Would you let him play? And obviously there's their conversations you can have in, in your own time. But I guess the philosophy of what we're getting at is like being really strong on achieving those things that if you think they're important and you value in them, then and just so just really pushing, pushing the athlete to get there. And the people of Australia and people of Melbourne have been lucky enough to have Ender King over numerous times to discuss this topic and you've been the one to, to facilitate that. What are the biggest takeaways that you've had from Ender from his uh, his workshops and his seminars and things through Sports Map? Yep, no, the great man. So I certainly think he's um, had a big influence on the way I practice, certainly. I think probably the biggest change of what I've picked up is well, probably a couple of things I chatted to there, but uh, since working with him, is certainly probably just being better at um, being able to really tease out those nuances and what's missing so i think uh that's probably the, the main thing i personally have pulled from that's what i'm referencing around okay i'm in the, i'm in the clinic or on the physio table and i'm getting him in the gym and you can just find those differences like by loading someone up or putting him in positions it tells you more information so certainly that's uh one for a takeaway for some of the, the staff at home or physios at home to really make sure they're, they're moving through that process but uh, yeah, look, I think and is certainly progressing is key. So, you know, you can get stuck on, on one thing. He, he's really big on uh, as soon as they've achieved an exercise or as soon as they're, you know, if they're completing 80% of the reps, you know, too easy, too well, bang, it's time to progress them. And, and I think that's how I would work or we work in the sense of I couldn't leave an athlete and say, here, go do some exercises for a week and, you know, I'll, I'll see you in a week. We are literally with them every day, coaching them through these exercises, pushing them, all right, that's too easy, next step, all right, add some load here do this and um and just being really onto them onto them like that coaching every rep uh and that's that's super important and then i think um yeah uh, yeah and, and they're probably the main couple of things from Edna. and i guess um you know i still probably liaise with him here and there we're actually uh, heading over and doing a course for the for the clippers uh, la clippers in june he's run a couple of courses there uh with us through sports map so another opportunity to to work with him and see him do a few things there so um pretty lucky to have that sort of uh network with him and and guidance along the way so uh plenty to learn and encourage um people out there to maybe tune in he's done a couple of podcasts with you and and us and things like that so if you're interested in growing acl certainly tap into some of that stuff oh so he's going over to the clippers through you guys is that right? Yeah, we're both heading over there. Yep, end of June to uh, run his groin course and ACL course for some of the staff there. So uh, that's exciting for us to uh, head into the US and, and do something in that space. So, uh, you know, I think they'll get heaps out of it clearly and, uh, and it'll be great for us to sort of, um, yeah, put on a bit of a, a workshop for them. Nice, mate. Right, let's take a little bit of a slight detour and we'll go into an area that is definitely physio and snc collaborative space and that's building an injury prevention system which is obviously a, we could go for hours and hours on this no doubt but when it's when it comes to that uh, injury prevention system what does that look like for you in terms of a kind of an overall philosophy replicating what i mentioned uh, asked at the start really yeah i'll try to um i'll sort of go over a bit of a, a general quick framework and probably 
more speak to, I guess, to the space I see myself working in as physio and the physio's role maybe in this because I think obviously it is such a, a broad topic. But I certainly, uh, you know, fall in line with the, the trip model and, and, the, and Matt Wallen's written for you guys on one of your blogs and has presented um, along with some other guys like Martin Wallen have been great with this. But really looking at that primary prevention, which for me is that addressing, you know, your key rec- risk factors that go across the whole group. So certainly knowing your sport and knowing what type of injuries um, that are there. But, you know, for me, they're the real big rocks that everyone gets. And that's about being, you know, making sure our training loads are really high, making sure their athletes are strong, make sure the athletes are recovering well and sleeping well, make sure they're eating well, um, and making sure they're sort of hitting their speeds and, and having really good speed exposures. So I think they're just like the non-negotiables that just need to be there in, in performance sport and any sport. Um, and you can obviously break those down to, to many different levels further from there. Uh, I guess where I'll probably, you know, clearly physios play a huge role now. Anyone in a club, it's all a very collaborative space in, in the way you work. But I guess that secondary prevention, which is that next step phase, which is probably whether you're trying to uh, stop an injury from becoming something more sinister or putting things in place where we are now probably individualizing things a little bit more. So being a bit more selective in our injury prevention approach. And that's probably something I'm really strong on. I think I, I use the term sometimes like stopping the energy leaks. So if I'm a physio and uh, I can identify that, you know, this guy clearly has a, a deficit in, uh, I'll use a similar example, where hip abduction strength. All right, if he's now running, clearly he's not going to be, one, as efficient. Two, he may need to use to overload different patterns and movements, which one, might lead susceptible to injury, or two, might just lead to sort of increased fatigue or overload or, you know, a, a loss in performance. Same thing would apply for if he's, you know, poor calf strength or poor foot and ankle stiffness you know, same thing in that sense. And I guess sometimes that's how I talk to an athlete about it. And to simplify saying it's really important you nail this down because this is a this is something that, you know, could affect you moving forward. So I think as a physio, and uh, I talked about some of those benchmarks earlier around some of the, the testings around the hip, as well as uh, we would also do some of our testing around, obviously, the calf hamstring uh, and some of our hopping metrics just to make sure we're seeing one where we want the athletes at to where these athletes are at currently uh, and trying to pick that up and make a change in that uh, and make a change quickly so that's probably one element which we can talk to more a little bit shortly around um, you know uh, addressing those individual areas that we think is a space for growth for that athlete and and two is clearly you know which sort of falls in line with the screening so screening in, in quotation marks but Screening for us is really just knowing the athlete, knowing where they're at in the status of um, how they're responding to the loads placed upon them. So, uh, you know, we would do regularly, as, as most clubs would, uh, looking at some metrics around a hamstring strength marker a couple of days after a game, a squeeze marker, and we do some, some hopping stuff on a force plate. And I guess um, the important thing around those is, as I say, most people do it. It's probably how well you do it. And and how much you actually pay attention to detail on one uh, those results, but two, what's your process um, following on from that? So I guess that's something uh, maybe we can chat through a little bit further as well. Of course. So is there any particular tests or profiling again in in quotation marks that you do with every player? to get an idea of where they're at to see maybe at the start of the season. So you can see where they may need, may need individual attention. Um, and how does that kind of progress over the year that you hit, hit things regular, uh, regular, um, on regular cadence, or you use the kind of monitoring as that profiling, just to explain that process for us, if you could. Yeah. So if we talk around and I, and I'll still, if we're talking around the space we're in around that, energy leaks and profiling we certainly do so start of the season we'll look at make sure we get out our hip extension strength hip abduction hip adduction strength look at hamstring strength uh, which is a nordic measure uh, we'll look at some seated calf strength which is uh, on a force plate and, and a seated calf isometric test we'll look at our calf endurance test which is a simple uh, calf raise to fatigue test uh, and then we will look at, I feel like I'm missing one there, but then, and we also will, I may be missing one other little thing that we would often look through, but then we also would break up. So that's probably one section where we break that into like a pie chart and make sure they're yeah, relevant to our benchmarks. And I've got Josh Ruddy, who's an awesome uh, sports scientist who's whipped up some 
fantastic graphs uh, for each athlete that sort of shows where they're at on a benchmark level um, and, and where they're not at. So it's really clear and easy for us to say, well, clearly you're sitting here. This is the outlier for you. This is this is you. Let's let's target this. Um, so especially for our young guy, younger guys, we'll test that at least three times throughout the year to see that they're improving and addressing those key areas across three different time points. Um, for, I guess, our main group and the more senior athletes, a lot of them might only have like one or two things that are they're sitting out where we want them. So it might be, well, your hip extension strength's at, you know, seven times your body weight. You know, we need it at nine. You're getting a few of these little signs. We need to really hammer this home. So then in that case, it's like, bang, here's, here's your exercise or entry point. This is how often you're going to do it. This is our load. We need you to progress it like so. How many days a week? And then we'll review that four weeks and we want to start to see that improve and essentially get every athlete out to that level. Um, and once they are at that level, then, you know, fantastic. Like at least that's a nice, almost like a starting point for us and we can just go further again to sort of maybe targeting something further that they, either they think or we think they need uh, that will further assist them. So they're, they're probably our main ones around that, you know, some capacity and, and strength measures. Um, we certainly also break down some of that calf some of our calf profiling with our hopping metrics. So to make sure, you know, we have a certain level of benchmarks that we want each athlete to be able to perform uh, and, and, and sit in our chart of being good foot and ankle stiffness, which we do have over our, um, do those a five hop test on the force plate and, and try to correlate that a little bit with our seated calf strength measure. So I'd like to um, uh, each athlete to be sitting in our top right hand corner of that graph, meaning they're over 1.8 times their body weight on a seated calf strength and uh, at least showing some decent um, foot and ankle stiffness uh, measures and no real uh, glaringly obvious discrepancies or, or differences left to right. So that hop test, just five vertical hops on the force plane? Yeah, yeah. Currently it's five yeah. vertical hops or six, but it records the um, records the five um, and yeah, measure there or, or, or cueing there is to spend as little time on the ground as they can and get as high as they can. Um, yeah, and, and we do that as part of our screening as well, just to sort of look at how they're responding a little bit each week to, to see if that gives us further information to, to picking up any sort of new subtle signs. And that's something we've been um, yeah, exploring with over the last uh, six to eight weeks and um, building that through into our profiling system, which we think is, you know, um, certainly around calves. If, we're, if we've got good calf strength and good calf endurance, then sort of what's next and what does the athlete need to do to both improve whether they're functional or performance to either you know assist in injury risk mitigation or just um you know be really consistent at a good level is there anything in that profiling that you've binned because of lack of value or introduced because of new research that's come along or a new a particular area that is kind of maybe squad wide that is on the rise in terms of injuries Certainly been things over the years. So, I mean, part of our screening um, that, you know, I talked around some of those, uh, the hamstring, the adductor strength and a bit of the hopping, they'll also get on the physio table and, and we will do a quick fire screen of them just to almost look further into some of those um, uh, quick fire strength measures and different range things that more just give us an idea to, to look at the athlete and have a bit of a chat through that process. Um, but I guess in saying that, that's, things like that we would have been routinely like a few years ago there was you know a sit and reach or a test like that uh years before that there was some counter movement tests that we're doing um and, and i guess it's probably for us around what or where i see what's really actionable and what's really going to give us information we need that's really going to guide our decision making and process so um I guess, and what we've added, you know, last year we had some issues with calves, so we've really probably nailed down around, one, how we're profiling our calves, and two, how we're tracking some strength metrics through rehab. I, I think prior to that, a lot of calf stuff's done on a bit of feel, so you can hop and that looks okay, and you can do some strength exercise and that looks okay, but to probably really, you know, with a hamstring, for instance, you, you've really got some clear tests along the way that are objective, and, and I think we needed that with calves, so I think that's where that's come from. Um, you know, and, and there's probably uh, levels of, of research to sort of come through and, and quantify the importance of those type of things, which I think some guys like Brady Green and um, the like are doing some fantastic work in that space over the coming years that I think will come out as well as Colin Griffin and, and, and many others. Um, but I guess, 
it's probably not as much as like throwing things out and putting things in. I guess for, for us, it's as much about uh, what's actually providing it and you know not over intervening with this information you get. I think uh, you could jump at shadows and think, oh, his groin squeeze is down or his hamstring power is down. But I think it's really important to note that our screening measures or numbers that we're getting are not a decision-making tool. They are purely there to um, maybe flag something or at least start that conversation with the physio or a clinician to then say, okay, so how are you going? That's down. All right, well, let's look at this. Let me look at a couple of quick things. Look, everything looks okay. Do, do a bit of this and, and retry that squeeze and we're away. Or is it actually saying to you, well, actually, oh, hold on. His, his range of motion is actually down and he's got some pain on his groin contraction. He's showing some early signs here of, fatigue or under recovery around his adductor longus so that's where you know uh you know always being the first point of call for us is okay we want players training um but clearly probably using our clinical knowledge and, and bringing the context of where that player's at and where that players come from where we're at in the season and making really clear decisions about what's best for them and, and the team moving forward so we're not um you know not ending up like the athlete we are talking about at the start, which has had groin pain for a few months and, and struggling to get going. So it's probably about, that's where I say about picking that up early, being really aggressive with what we're doing with that. And, you know, if that is running straight line for a session, that's running straight line for a session. If that is saying, hey, you've got some adductive signs, but you're also showing some fatigue and weakness and tightness here. Well, let's have it. Let's really address this. Let's go bang. Um, or is it looking at their overall gym program and, and making some subtle changes or improvements around what they need to be really targeted for them? Um, and that's probably what that's a lot of that sort of week to week screening and that process is about for us. So, is there anything that you've added in, or has this been quite a <laughs> that was a question? Yeah, process long way and away to no, add the fine, process. Well, each not so much added in. I, I think our hamstring sort of uh, monitoring we added in a few years ago, and that was on the back of some of Martin Wallen's work. Uh, we added in the hop stuff this year. Essentially, is where I was getting out. We probably added that in uh, ten weeks ago, I think. Um, the development of the ease of being able to do that with the force plates and the um, that tech equipment you have these days and to be able to pull that data through and, and to have it presented and, and look nice as a, a system. Again, some of our work from Josh Ruddy is, just makes that process really easy. Um, and, I, and I think, again, you know, there's not too much else out there to read into week to week changes within our hopping numbers. But I think if we're getting a player who's doing a five hop and they have a left or right difference of, 20%, then for me, that's something we're like, why is there a 20% difference there and how are we going to fix that? Um, and I think in also in our setting, probably experienced a few times, we've got young players, they don't always report things. Um, you know, they come in and all of a sudden on Thursday, they'll tell you they've got a tight calf that's been there for four days. So I guess it's like hopping there and they're like, oh, I can't hop because my calf's tight. Oh, okay, why is it tight? Let's go have a look. Uh, and it's probably about just having that covered basis in there for us the same thing for maybe some some early bone stress signs you know oh my hopping's not feeling as good today i don't know why oh let's just have a look it's probably just having something there for our foot and ankle that um you know in the past we would say do a couple of hops like to give us five hops and how's that feel yeah but at least this actually gives us a number it asks for a little bit more effort in the output uh and so far it's giving us some good information but um you know still it's, it's probably in a in a time to you know collect some data and and look at how we're doing it but i think as i say it just comes back to uh, a conversation started for us as physios to explore further nice mate well we're coming to time but one thing that i did want to ask you and this this definitely is not just related to physio although it, it, it will be kind of from your perspective because it relates to everything in our industry or any industry how can clinicians physios snc sports scientists know who to trust in this modern world how do you go about that <laughs> yeah yeah uh and we're talking here from an education standpoint i guess around cost of course who to trust in Not the just space generally, of, like who's gonna rob you yeah who are you gonna trust uh <laughs> yeah yeah uh it's look it's a i was gonna say it's a minefield but clearly there's like so much content out there to that if you're a physio looking to learn all you need to do is Google something or get on Instagram and there's people doing education courses all over the place. And as a physio, I think that's it's really prominent. Um, and I guess oh, how I do it or how uh, I would do it on behalf of Sports Map or for Sports Map is I think it's super important to have uh, really credible 
presenters or researchers or clinicians in what's driving our profession forward. And, and that's what we're trying to do in the sense of, and I'm talking here sports physio profession, probably more so than just physio. Um, how are we actually going to get better at what we're doing? And I think if you're a younger physio, that's got to be brought forward by people who have either um, done some really quality research, because I think the way to really, if they've proven themselves in doing research, that's clearly showing one an in-depth knowledge of you know what they're doing. They're critiquing what they're doing. They're trying to prove you know, uh, and, and eliminate their bias towards, you know, what works for them. So I think uh, looking for someone who has done some research in the past or someone who has, um, at the very least, I think, need to have moved through a pathway of education, like uh, at least, uh, you know, a be a titled in Australia, we have a, a master's program in sports physio or there's further program from there in the specialisation. So looking for someone who has actually moved through that pathway of further education um, and not simply just pulled out and started saying, oh, I'm just going to do courses because uh, this is how I like to do stuff. So watch me do it. And I, I think um, really looking out for that, I think, because you're just going to take on other people's bias um, into the way you practice. And, and then I think finally, at the very least, having someone who's really experienced working in, in a sports setting or, or with athletes. So years and years of doing that and, and having tried and tested things and, and being wrong over the time and, and not being um, being able to admit they don't know things and, and to work through things and not think they know know everything, I guess, watching for the people who uh, are to, to claim to have the answer to fix everything, I, I guess. And I, I would encourage just um, physios and SSC guys alike, I guess, to just do your background research on people who you're attending courses with um, and also ensuring that you're sort of staying true to your own um, self-development and education and still reading some research. And, and that's probably more than just reading the, the abstract or a research review that someone else has written on behalf of someone who did the research. It's probably actually like trying to tease out further processes and, and, and through to some make sure you're challenging what you're thinking and what you're doing. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a tough one, mate, because I think if I was two years out or three years out of being a physio, like I wouldn't know where to start and I see some cool, sexy looking things with some fun looking rehab exercises, I would probably go to that course. But I don't think that's really gonna give me the, the foundations of what I need to, to move forward um, and know the inner workings and to, to then build through that, that process. So um, yeah, again, again, not a plug for us, but that's something that I, I you know, I think you know, I will stay really true to with sports map that uh, we're only getting the best of the best that we think are, are well credentialed people to hopefully, um, you know, bring forward the the next future sports physio stars that, you know, a, a really good resource for them to, to guide them along the way and to then critique what they're doing and to ask more questions and, and sort of keep pushing their own learnings forward. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. What do you think? There. Mate, go, just. Yeah, I mean, like you say, if I was two or three years out of a sports science degree or S&C Masters or whatever it is, it's tough going. Like people, there's these kind of false influencers who have got 100,000 followers, which is how people gauge um, quality, it seems nowadays. And you get these people who are just doing mad stuff and it rubs people in and gets attention and people buying online courses from these people, people buying workshops to these people and it's uh it's tough it's really tough in the in the world where like i say these kind of things are valued more than the three things that you mentioned um so it is it is tough going but like you say on the sportsmith kind of philosophy is just go to the best people around and i say best people from our perspective again based on the three things that that you mentioned rather than being sucked in by the the social media influence which is is tough not to do um but yeah you've got to stay i suppose stay true to to, to the, those three things that you mentioned yeah there's some awesome uh many awesome sports physios and clinicians out there that uh are just unreal to learn from but uh, often those guys are the ones sort of just doing the work and uh less fanfare about uh what they're doing so harder to find uh you probably got to Make sure you're looking at what's coming out of the research and look at people who are doing great jobs at, at clubs or in clinics and things like that and, and try to tease from there because they're, they're often not the big self-promoters. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. And that's what makes it even that's what it makes it even tougher because when you want to know about something, well, you Google them. If they're, if they're nowhere to be seen or they've got 
you know, a, a, a couple of PubMed um, uh, papers on PubMed or they've got no Twitter account, no Instagram account. It's difficult to kind of get a sense of who these people are and that, that makes it even even tougher. But um, yeah, it's a, it's difficult. It's really difficult. But thank Nick, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you for lining up so quickly and uh, for bearing with me with the the to and fro with dates and things. But anyone that wants to know more about you, wants to know about more about Sports Map, where's the best place for people to find you? Yeah, thanks, mate. It's been good to come on and have a chat. Uh, certainly, probably LinkedIn's probably the the easiest one to contact uh, myself personally. Uh, sports Map, you can reach out uh, via Sports Map um, the contact page, but we're at sportsmap.com.au feel free to check out uh, the masterclass platform there and, and reach out with any, any questions or queries around that space. Um, but yeah, they're probably the two, two main, two uh, best mediums, mate. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Hope I haven't destroyed your evening with a little one too much, but um, nah, thank no you very much for your time. She, I really appreciate she, it. <laughs> no, she got to sleep at the start, mate. So it's uh, perfect, but no, thanks very much for having me. Um, yeah, I appreciate having a chat and, and you know, uh, hopefully there's some information there that some people can get and, and you know, a lot of that, you know, I, I pay uh, uh, tribute to a lot of people I've learnt off over the years with a lot of um, those things and we mentioned a few of those guys' names but there's many others out there from, you know, Josh Heary to uh, Andrew Mosler and, uh, you know, Steve Saunders and, and Andrew Wallace, some really great uh, hip and groin clinicians that uh, I certainly base a lot of my work off and, and through those guys so um, there's some names to look out for as well. Perfect. Thanks, mate. Have a good evening. You too. Thanks, mate. Champion. Cheers, buddy.